Okay, lecture 26, the second coming of the Lord. So the second coming of the Lord is a very controversial topic among the church nowadays because many people have different ideas of how the Lord will come, but we must believe according to the Bible. We must, although there are many theories about the coming of the Lord, we must believe according to what the Bible says because this is a part of the covenant. In John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and, I, and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. The Lord's second coming is something so present in the Bible that it is referred to 300 times approximately in the New Testament. Um, just to give you an idea, the passages relate, related to the second coming of the Lord cover one tw uh, 125th part of all passages in the New Testament. That is to say, so many passages in the New Testament cover or give the idea or give a clear answer about the coming of the Lord. The Lord is preparing rooms for us and He's, he's saying, I will call you back. And then the Lord will come a second time, now not to bear our sin, but to bring an eternal salvation to us who are waiting for Him. To look at some of the characteristics that the Lord says in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, it says, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. Luke chapter 21 verse 27 says, At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So here we see certain characteristics that are being said. It says, he will come back in the same way he was taken, he will come back. That is to say, there will be no other type of coming. He will come back just in the same way and we will see Him come in a cloud with power and great glory. Power and great glory. That means everyone will be able to recognize, everyone will be able to see the coming of the Lord. We will know that it happens. Even if we're in any part of the world, we will know when this coming of the Lord will happen. And it says that for many it will be a time of mourning. It will be a time of crying for many people. And it says, they will look on me, the one who, uh, who they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Many people will see the coming of the Lord and they will cry. Why? Because they will see the Messiah in his full display of glory and they will cry. They will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So the coming of the Messiah, although it is a joy for us, although it is something that we truly long for and we truly hope for, for us Christians who believe that Jesus is a Christ, for others it will be a time of mourning. It will be a time of great grievance. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Matthew 24, 42 says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 says, so you, must also, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. So, the coming of the Lord will not only be as He has been ascended, not only will it be with power and glory, not only will it be a time of mourning and grievance for many people, but also it will be unexpected. It will be a time that we do not know. Many people have tried to figure out the date. Many people have tried to figure out with mathematical calculations or to delve deep into the Bible to see where, when the Lord will come and they have stated a date or an hour and a time. However, the Lord says, 
Do not concern yourself with that. You do not know it. Not even the angels know it. Only the Father has it in His own authority. He is the one who knows. So do not concern yourself. However, be wary. Keep watch. Be awake. Always be expecting the coming of the Lord because He will come like a thief in the night. That means He will not give you any warning. He will come and then you will know. Therefore, you must be ready. The Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. So the coming of the Lord is very real. The coming of the Lord was something that He warned several times. And He said, keep watch. You should be awake. You should be alert. Do not live like the Lord is coming. He is coming certainly, but you will not be expecting Him. So He will come. However, although we do not know the time of His coming, He has given us a hint or a clue about His coming. The things that will happen before the end. And in Matthew ch chapter 25, it speaks about so many things that will happen, including wars, pestilence, famine, and earthquakes, many other, other things. But here it says in Matthew 24, uh, um, chapter 24, verse 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. This gospel, this gospel of the kingdom must first be preached. This is one of the end signals. It'll happen. The world, the world will know that the, the gospel, that Jesus is a Christ. They will have the testimony. Not everyone will believe it. The world evangelization is not about everyone believing it. But everyone must have the testimony of this gospel. And then the end will come. This is what was promised. And this second coming, this second arrival of the Lord is the covenant that we have. If we see throughout the Old Testament, we see many historical covenants. That is to say, a, a covenant or a promise that was given to certain individuals in certain times. For example, we can see um, Noah. Noah had the covenant of building the ark. His covenant for him, it was to build the ark because there would be a day of judgment. So his covenant was, hold on to this covenant. The day of judgment will come, build an ark so that you and your family may be saved. For others, for Israel, at one time, it was the, um, the travel to Canaan or the going to the promised land. He promised the Israelites, you must go to the land of flowing milk and honey. You must go there. You must go there and you must establish yourself in the land that was promised to you. Why? Because that is the land that the Messiah will come in. The land that the Messiah will come in, you must inhabit that land. That is why they held this covenant. This was a promise of God to them. And so forth. Many people, just as the, in the age of captivity of Babylon, the freedom from that Babylon, God gave many types of covenant to the people. And uh, although the eternal covenant is the coming of the Messiah, the eternal covenant is the Messiah and His work Himself, He now gives us a covenant regarding this Messiah that is His second coming. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 to 17 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. This was the original covenant given to man. And we know the consequence of the covenant. Genesis chapter 3 verse 2 to 3, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from a tree that is in the middle of the garden, you must not touch it or you will die. So the covenant that God had given was something very certain. It was something that had a clear consequence. However, the woman did not know the covenant very well. As we have seen before, the woman did not know the covenant very well. She answered to the serpent's question, you must not eat from the fruit that uh, from you must not eat fruit from a tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Eve, uh, God had never said anything about touching the fruit. However, she knew the covenant. She knew something very similar to the covenant. She had the general idea of the covenant, but she did not know the exact covenant. Therefore, Satan attacked and told her, you will not die. When we do not hold on to the covenant of God, or we do not have a clear knowledge of the covenant of God, then Satan can attack us with something that is very similar, something that seems like the word of God. However, it is totally different. It is a violation of the covenant. And that is why we can see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when 
The woman saw the fruit that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it also. So it was not only Eve's fault, it was not only the woman's fault, Adam could have not, could have not eaten it. He could have said, woman, do not eat of this fruit. He could have said, even though you eat, I will not eat. I will keep the covenant of God. But both failed. Both truly broke the covenant of God. And we can see the reason why in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul says here, I was once a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, I was a violent man. I was someone who was persecuted, I was a murderer of Christians, I was a murderer of the body of Christ. But why? Why did I do that? Why did I break the covenant? Why did I constantly become an enemy of God? It was because I was in ignorance and I acted in unbelief. Ignorance and unbelief are two of the things that attack the covenant. Eve was ignorant of the covenant. That means she did not know the covenant, the covenant very well. She may have had a general idea, but she did not know the covenant in the exact manner. That is why she responded to the serpent in such a way. You must not touch, and, the, and if you eat of this fruit, then you will die. Not certainly die, just you may die. In some translations in the Bible, it, say, it says, so that you do not die. So, because you may die if you eat the fruit. That was Eve's knowledge of the covenant. So she was acting in ignorance. However, Adam, he knew the covenant. He heard it from God. Maybe Eve heard it from Adam, but Adam certainly heard it from God. But Adam had a choice to make. When the covenant was before him, when this scene of Satan and Eve was before him, he saw a reality. He saw his wife eating of this fruit, but she did not die. That reality was in front of him. The covenant was broken, but there was no consequence. That reality was in front of him, but he knew the covenant. He knew that God said, you will surely die. So what he saw before his eyes was not death, but God had said, the word of God said, you will die. So he had reality and truth being confronted. The truth of the covenant of God and the reality that Satan shows us was before him. What did he choose? Did he choose the covenant or did he choose his reality? He chose his, rea his reality. The woman did not die, so he ate also because he preferred reality over truth. Therefore, we must also know this, the covenant that is being given to us, the covenant of the second coming of the Lord is also true. The covenant of the second coming of the Lord is given to us clearly. He will come and He will come. The end will come when all these signals are fulfilled. He will come like a flash of thunder from the east to the west. Everyone will be able to see Him. His angels and the glory of the Lord will be manifested. He will certainly come, but are we believing it? Are we holding on to this covenant? Because if we're not, then it means we're like Adam. We're seeing our reality. We're seeing the things of this world. It seems like this world will not end. It seems like the Lord will not come. 2,000 years have passed since the Lord ascended and He's not coming. That is what many people think. The Lord will not come, but He gave us a covenant. Our reality, the reality that Satan is showing us through the world is the Lord will not come. However, the truth that the Lord has said is, I will come. We have the same choice as Adam. Do we believe our reality? Do we live like the Lord is not coming? Because now we're not ignorant of this covenant. Many people may be ignorant of this covenant. Many people may not know of the coming of the Lord. However, we do. We are like Adam. We have read this word of God. Now we know about the coming of the Lord. Of the Lord. Then will we believe it or will we not? If, because if we believe it, then we will act according to this belief. Because if we believe that the Lord is coming, then we know all the things in the earth will pass. Nothing will matter in this earth except the coming of the Lord. He is coming and He will judge everyone because of their actions. He will come and He will ask you, this talent that I have given you, this gospel that I have given you, have you preached it? 
Have you internalized it? Have you believed in it? Have you fulfilled my covenant of becoming the witness in all of the earth? Have you lived for it? Or have you lived because of your own desire? Have you lived to make a good family, to have a good life, to make your own children, to uh, secure your f the future for your children, and then retire and have a peaceful life? Have you lived because of that? Or, or have you lived because of me? Mm. Knowing that my day is close, knowing that I can come at any moment, knowing that I will come as a thief in the night. Are you living this day holding on unto this covenant? Or are you not holding on to this covenant? Are you considering my covenant a lie? This is what the Lord is asking of us. You, we must believe in Jesus as a Christ, and then we must live for the advent of the Lord. We must clearly understand, as in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the vo voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will be with the Lord forever. This is what Paul says. The dead in Christ. That means those who believe that Jesus is a Christ. Even if they died, they will be alive on that day. And those who we are, are living, who those who are witnesses, that's, that glorious day will be risen up into the air and will meet the Lord. We will truly see Him face to face. And this is, is not what every Christian should want to meet the Lord to say truly Lord you are here to truly see him face to face is that not the desire of anyone who calls himself Christian we must clearly believe this there is no other priority the dead in Christ will rise so even if you die you will rise in Christ but you must live in order for this covenant to be fulfilled 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, it says, As you look forward to the day of the Lord and speed its coming, that day will bring out the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. All the things that we have worked for so hard in this world, this church building, the chairs, maybe even um, the car that we brought for the ministry, all of those are secondary. And on that day in the Lord, they will melt with the elements. All of things will fade away. Our houses, our money, our health, all of that will not matter anymore. Only what will matter is that we'll be before the Lord. So please just wait for that day. You, look, you will look forward to that day. That is, for many people, it is a day of weeping. It is a day of grievance. But for us, it is a joyful day. It is the utmost day in which we can meet the Lord. So speed, it's coming. Not only look forward to it, but speed, it's coming. You have the duty to accelerate the coming of the Lord. We must completely obey this covenant. How can we hold on to the covenant? How can we obey the covenant? Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul was there to finish. He wanted to finish the race, to complete the task. That means he wanted to fulfill world evangelization. Only with the gospel that Jesus is a Christ, only this gospel can save. Many people talk about God, many people talk about Jesus, but you're not proclaiming the gospel, you're not only testifying the gospel because you speak of Jesus. Many people can speak of Jesus, many people can speak of God, but testifying the God-given the, the God gospel is to testify that Jesus is a Christ. Why is He the Christ? Why do we need Him in our life? What does it mean that Jesus is a Christ and we must believe in Jesus as a Christ, the solver of all problems? Then we're testifying of this gospel. If not, we have spoken about, about something else. <clears throat> So Paul says, I am here to complete the task. I will complete this. That is why he said, I must go to Rome also. I must go to Spain also. Why? Because he's, for him, the end of the world was Spain. He was intent on, co on completing this mission of testifying the gospel to all the world. We must live like this. This is a covenant given to us as well. Testifying the gospel that Jesus is a Christ to all of the world. Now we have it so easy. Now for us, it is so easy. We have airplanes, we have mass media, we have many ways of truly preaching the gospel. And we must live this way because this covenant is also given to us. But it is not our effort. 
It is not our power that will finish this work. Jesus, the Christ, will, will fulfill everything according to the covenant. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the one. He is the one who will fulfill this covenant. Revelation 22, verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. He who, is testify he who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. The Lord is saying, I will come to meet you and I am coming soon. What was the faith of the early church? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Please come. Many people are afraid of the Lord's coming. When people use the word apocalypse in order to refer to the end of times, for them, it is something wicked. It is the destruction of the world. It is something fearsome. But for Christians, that is a day we look forward to because all the world is dead. All the world it will be melted with the elements. Everything will be gone, but we will be one with the Lord. We will meet the Lord, and that will be the day when we can see Him face to face. And that is what the early church believers believed, even though they were being thrown to a pit of lions, even if they were being persecuted, even if they were being pierced by spears. What they said was, it does not matter. I live with the Lord, I die for the Lord, and now I await that day. I await that day of the resurrection, I await that day of judgment, because I have believed in Jesus, who is the Christ. For us, this needs to be our faith. Many churches do not believe this way. But for us, we must believe according to the Bible. I am not saying this to criticize. I am not saying this to make anyone feel bad. But I am saying this so that we can truly, um, we can truly look at all of this and have the correct faith according to the Bible. The Lord will come soon. The Lord will come and He will ask of us. He will reward us according to what each of us has done. What is the will of God? We have seen this before. What is the will of God? So that no one may be lost. He is being patient with us so that everyone may come to repentance. He is being patient with us. Therefore, we must obey, we must hold on to the covenant. Even if the world says the Lord is not coming, even if the people say, yes, He is being late, we must hold on to the covenant. Jesus is a Christ and He will come back again. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you because you have allowed us to once again hold on to the covenant of your second coming. Lord, we await this day in which we can be with you. Lord, although the things in this earth may seem tempting, although the things in this earth may seem good, Lord, they are not. It is much better to be with you. Lord, we want this day to come very soon. We want to be used in order to accelerate this day, to speed your coming, Lord. Lord, allow us to hold on to this covenant that you will come like a thief in the night and you will reign with your bride, the church, forever and forever in the new heaven, in a new earth. And we want to be in that day. We want to be alive when that happens, Lord. Use our lives, Lord, to, so that we can fulfill world evangelization in our days, but not our effort, Lord, not our strength, but you, Lord. Guide us through your Holy Spirit. Guide us, Lord, by everything that you are doing through us so that our countries may hear the testimony that Jesus is a Christ Amen. and so we may speed your coming. Yes. In the name of Jesus who is a Christ who will come soon, we pray. Amen. Amen.